Annie in Montreal as well, and Leanne Stanley from Kelowna Paddle Center. And today's guest, special guest, is Zoe Norcross New from Comox Racing Canoe Club, and uh, she's also a principal at Hanahoe Paddle Sports up in Comox, uh, which is the uh, company that brings in all the boats that everyone loves. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, just some housekeeping items first. Uh, we'd like to ask everybody to mute their microphones during the presentation. Uh, Zoe will provide uh, some, some brief uh, spots for comments. Um, we ask everybody to use the chat function uh, to submit comments and Eric, Val and Leanne will monitor the, and I will monitor the chat and we'll pose those questions to Leanne during the session. Um, and also uh, just a note that we are recording today's session so that um, other people who aren't able to make it today can watch it. So as a result, uh, if you remain on the call, you automatically you do, are deemed to consent to the posting on the internet of any contribution you may make to today's call. So if you uh, appear on screen, uh, you may will be on the recording and so you'll appear on the internet uh, with your name uh, and you won't receive any compensation for that. Okay. Okay, so I'll now hand it all over to Leanne to uh, introduce Zoe. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us once again for a Coral Off the Water series. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce my friend Zoe. Um, I got to know Zoe back in ooh, 2010, I think it was, as we prepped for the 2011 um, Nawahini OK Kai, um, as we did the crossing together in 2011. And I learned so much with this lady in the front of our boat. Oh my gosh. I learned so much about waves and the ocean in terms of just because you can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist and it's not there and you can't ride it. So instead of always relying on your eyes to rely on your ass and what you feel and just what you know about wave science. And so I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. I need to spend more time with this lady. Um, so she's got a background in um, outrigger canoe and surf ski racing, um, professionally uh, in coastal and marine sciences. And so that's kind of some of the knowledge she's going to share with us today is how that ocean moves. And once again, you guys all know my philosophy is <laughs> work smarter, not harder. So how can we use that water's energy to help us go faster? So it is my great pleasure to introduce Zoe um, to all you folks. Um, for her to share this talk. Thank you so much for that really glowing introduction, Leanne. No pressure. <laughs> I got you back. I, I like that um, learning to uh, think with your butt, feel with your butt. Uh, that's very, very true. Um, yeah, I wish I had a silver bullet for y'all today in terms of here's what you need to know to be an amazing downwind paddler. Um, I, I don't, uh, sadly, I'll, I'll just preface with that. But um, yeah, there's, there's, a, I, I think that for a lot of people, um, this the concept of, of paddling in waves is, um, is a little bit can be a little bit scary, because waves feel a little bit foreign or, or uncomfortable. And so I, I think that um, it can be really helpful to just get a better understanding of how waves work and the way that they move so that when you are out there, you can sort of better understand what's going on around you and that can help you feel a little bit more at home. So um, yeah, just to um, follow up on a little bit on more on the introduction. Um, um, I live in the Comox Valley on Vancouver Island. Um, I am a part owner of Hanahoe Paddle Sports with Don Irvin and um, Don and my late husband, Rick, uh, used to have Hanaho Paddle Sports was their business and they, it was mostly primarily a coaching business and they made canoe paddles. Um, and then just shortly after the time that my husband passed away, um, uh, uh, we started, uh, um, Outrigger Zone asked us if we wanted to start carrying their canoes. So um, with Outrigger Zone, the, Michael Giblin and Wendy Giblin, who are the owners of Outrigger Zone are some of my best friends from when we lived in Hawaii. I did live in Hawaii for 13 years. Um, I went to the University of Hawaii, got a uh, bachelor's and master's degrees there in coastal uh, geology. And I actually taught oceanography at the University of Hawaii Maui campus. 
And so that's essentially what you're getting here today is uh, an Oceanography 101 uh, presentation on waves. It's just basic introduction to waves. And um, yeah, uh, I really miss Hawaii and really miss the waves and paddling over there and um, paddling with Lan. Um, but things have been pretty busy the last few years. And so a lot of you may not have ever seen me around or may not know me. Um, but, you know, just wait a couple years when my kids graduate. Um, I'll probably be right back in the outdoor scene again. <laughs> anyway, for now, um, yeah, we are going to um, move into a uh, presentation here. So just bear with me for one second. Get set up. Okay, just change the size a bit. Great. All right. So um, is this, uh, can everybody see the presentation okay? Thumbs up, Leanne? Yep, good. Okay, awesome. So um, I, I think I was just going to start with one, um, one thing I want you to think about as far as a takeaway point today. Um, when flat water has been your introduction and, and uh, your most of your paddling uh, career, you kind of get this mindset of I need to be going as fast as possible um, and paddling as hard as possible at all time. And, and in order to be successful in downwind paddling, th those two things you have to let go of. And, and one of them is paddling as fast as possible at all times. And the second one is um, uh, uh, going as fast as possible at all times, because uh, in fact, um, there are going to be times when you're paddling in waves where you actually need to intentionally slow yourself down in order to, to prevent yourself from getting totally um, jammed up and stalled out. So slowing yourself down is actually a thing in downwind paddling that will make you go faster. So those are two sort of counterintuitive um, uh, con concepts that I just want you to have in the back of your mind when we're talking about everything we're going to be talking about here today. Um, um, I'm just um, texting my daughter to come let the dog out because she's scratching at my feet. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, let's move on here. Uh, so I mentioned, I was just talking about Michael Giblin. So Michael Giblin is the um, owner and um, uh, the brains behind Outrigger Zone who builds uh, you know, the Hurricane and Tempest Outrigger Canoes um, and the Vortex Six Man. But he also builds all of uh, Kai Va'a's canoes and Puakea's canoes as well. So um, I'm just going to uh, show this little video clip that um, Rick made of, of Michael talking about uh, downwind paddling. And so um, Leanne, again, can you give me a thumbs up as, if this video is uh, playing properly? Well, I think the biggest thing that people, the biggest mistake that people make is that they try to paddle the same way in flat water and in rough water so when you're when you're in rough water it's really a different game you want to you want to marshal your resources you want to save your energy when you don't really have an opportunity to go and then you want to go really hard when when the time's right so uh in flat water let's say you're going along and you got 80 percent effort if you bump it up to 90 percent effort you might gain just a tiny little bit of speed but in rough water if you bump it up by that same 10 percent you might double your speed. So it's really about uh, using your energy when, when the, the, the conditions permit and trying to be as efficient as possible and not beating yourself up when there's no opportunity. Just waiting for it to form up, waiting for it to happen, and then when it, when it opens up, then you just go, go, go. All right. Okay, back to the original here, back to the presentation. So, um, yeah, I think uh, uh, that's basically reinforcing what I was just um, previously uh, talking about as far as really, it's a completely different technique from flat water paddling to wave paddling. And so now what we're gonna get into is the actual um, physical science behind waves and how they work. And so we can sort of try to help you understand um, how it is that you need to be paddling different and why. Okay, so just a couple of quick concepts off the top. Waves actually are transmitting energy and not water mass across the ocean surface. So the water droplets on the surface of the wave are not actually 
themselves moving. Well, they'll move a little bit, but, and they'll move in sort of orbital shapes, but they are not actually traveling. It's, it's the energy that's traveling across the ocean. So that's key concept number one. Key concept number two is that the speed of ocean waves usually depends on their wavelength, how long the waves are, and the longest waves move the fastest. And the longest waves are also usually the biggest waves. Um, and concept number three, the behavior of a wave depends largely on the relationship between the wave size or, or the length of the wave and the depth of water through which it's moving. So all of these concepts we're going to be looking at in detail. I just wanted to sort of give you an overview before we dig into the science um, of what, what these concepts are that we're going to be talking about. And the last, the fourth concept um, is that becoming a good downwind paddler absolutely requires lots of time paddling downwind. So you can listen to me or somebody else or YouTube talk about it till we're blue in the face. But um, yeah, it's uh, it really the, the, the only surefire way to, to actually improve your skills is to spend the most possible time actually out there in the waves, figuring it out. And it takes time. On day one, you're not going to feel it. And on day two, you'll feel it a tiny bit. And it just, you know, each day it just gets a little bit better. But anyway, Understanding how waves form and move and where on the wave to aim your boat can save some frustration and help speed up the process. So that is my goal here today, is to try to help you have a bit of uh, a better understanding of the physical wave processes so that when you're out there, you have a better understanding of what you need to do. Okay, um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, um, ocean waves are just uh, visual proof that of transmission of energy across the surface of the ocean. So the water itself isn't moving. What um, it, it well, it'll, it'll move in an orb orbital motion, but you don't actually get the particles of water traveling with the waves. The wave just travels past them. So for instance, if you're watching a seagull bobbing on the surface of the ocean, it will do this uh, range of motion where it goes down and back and then it goes up and forwards. So you see it's kind of down and back and up and then forwards and down and back and up and forwards. It's like a circular orbital motion. So um, yeah, this is just how um, the, uh, the energy is being transmitted across the surface of the ocean. Now this slide also, we're gonna be looking at it again a little bit later in a little bit more depth, but um, for now, I think what I uh, just want you to uh, understand from this picture is that um, waves are generally considered deep water waves until they get into water that is uh, shallow enough to be uh, the same depth as half of the length of the wave. So if you're talking about a 200 foot long wave, like a 200 foot wavelength, then when that wave gets into shallow water, which is going to be 100 feet or less, that wave will start to change how it behaves. So this is, um, this is kind of an important concept because um, when you're doing downwind paddles, say in Hawaii or somewhere offshore, um, the waves behave like deeper water waves. But once you get close to shore, uh, the waves change how they're behaving. So um, once you get into this water, that's a half the depth of what the wavelength is, the wave will change its behavior. So when we talk about shallow waves, it's basically any wave that's in uh, water that's less than half its wavelength. Okay, but we'll be coming back to this a little bit more in a second. Um, just some wave terminology. Uh, the, the point on the top of the waves is called the wave crest. So A and B here are the wave crest and the bottom of the wave is the wave trough. So that's the, that's the lowest point. And the distance between the two crests or between the two troughs is called the wavelength. Um, yeah, and so we talked about those orbital paths of individual mo water molecules. Now, two other important terms are frequency and period. So frequency would be the number of waves that pass point A or point B each second. So basically cycles per second or waves per second. Um, which is the inverse of the period, or period is the inverse of frequency, which uh, period is the time required for the wave crest at point A to reach point B. So um, for instance, if you are sitting on the ocean and there is a swell moving underneath you, every time the, your, your boat or your surfboard or your canoe or whatever uh, rises up onto the crest, 
and then drops down and rises up again. The time between the two um, peaks of that, between the time you're sitting on the first crest and then sitting on the second crest, um, that's gonna be the period of the wave. Likewise, if you're standing on shore, watching the waves come into shore, um, the, the period is uh, the, the time between each wave breaking on the shore. So um, typical periods um, for surf are, are usually in the sort of 15 to 20 uh, second range um, for, for, um, yeah, for typical open ocean waves. So um, yeah, so these orbitals that we talked about earlier, as you get deeper in the water, as you get lower in the water column, the orbitals are still there, but they are getting smaller. And once you get to a water depth that's equivalent to half of the wavelength, then you stop feeling the orbitals. You'll just feel a tiny little bit of motion and then you will feel nothing below that. So um, except for any currents or tides that exist separate from the waves themselves. So if you were scuba diving, let's say, and um, it was a 200 foot long wave that was passing over top of you and you were in 50 feet of water, you'd be about here. And so you would feel your body getting moved around in this sort of orbital motion. But as you got deeper um, and you got to 100 feet deep, uh, you'd stop feeling that. So that's, um, yeah, that's basically the rule of thumb there. Uh, typical wavelengths, you're wondering how long is a wave. Um, typical wavelengths for open ocean swells are between 200 and 500 feet. Whereas a tsunami, we're not going to get into tsunamis and tides very much today, but um, those are much, much longer wavelengths. So a tsunami would have a wavelength of approximately 125 miles and a tide wavelength is basically half the circumference of the earth. So tide, uh, the tide waves are waves. Um, they have a crest and a trough, but they are way, way, way more massive than wind swells or yeah, open ocean ground swells. Okay, um, so what determines the characteristics of a wave? And so we talked before about uh, the orbitals. So it's, it's uh, the relationship between the wavelength and the water depth is pretty uh, important here. So wavelength will determine the size of the orbitals and the water depth will determine the shape of the orbitals. So in other words, if they are round or if they get squashed into ovals. Um, and we're gonna look at that concept again in just a second. Um, Typically, if we're looking at, if you're standing on shore and you're counting the time between the waves breaking on shore, or you're floating on a surfboard waiting for waves to pass you and trying to catch a wave in Tofino or something, um, or Hawaii, uh, if you count the time between those waves, that's the period. Now, um, with this uh, chart here, you can see that if the period was 12 seconds in between waves, the length for that wave is going to be on the order of say 230 meters and the speed of that wave is going to be traveling at about 20 meters per second. So the first thing I'd like you to think about when you see those types of speeds is, oh my gosh, can I get my canoe going 20 meters per second? And um, yeah, unfortunately we can't. So um, what's important to, to sort of grasp here is that these open ocean swells they're not the waves that we're trying to catch. We can't really catch them. They're just um, too big and too fast and they're not really steep enough. Although there are moments where we can kind of sometimes get a little ride from them or a little push from them, um, but we're uh, unlikely to stay on them when we're in the open ocean. The only time you can catch it is when it's breaking on shore and that would be a very expensive wave um, if you were in your OC1. So um, yeah, the goal is not to catch these open ocean waves, but they do, they're definitely critical and essential in helping us uh, move forward and um, ride the waves that we, that we are able to ride on, uh, yeah, when we're paddling downwind. Okay, so what happens to waves as they enter shallow water? The period, so that's the time between the waves breaking, it doesn't change um, with water depth. So the period will always stay the same. So a 20 second period um, out in the open ocean is still, those waves are still gonna be breaking on shore at 20 second intervals. 
So, um, but there's a lot of other parts of the wave that do change. For instance, the wavelength shortens as the waves enter shallow water. So as the wave uh, starts to feel the shallow water, there's friction on the bottom um, and it slows the wave down, uh, especially the bottom part of the wave. And the waves then start to bunch up. So they slow down, they bunch up, they get taller, and um, then they start to break. So this is here where you can see, so it's entered, the wave enters water that's half the depth of half of the wavelength. And uh, that's when it starts to feel the bottom. So this circular orbital will now um, start to change into more of an oval or orbital. And so at this point, um, the waves are getting compressed into a smaller space, but they're still uh, traveling at the same, um, free, uh, the same period. So that's when the waves will start to slow down, bunch up, get taller, and then they will spill and break closer to shore in the surf zone, if you were just floating there, you'd find yourself floating back and forth. Whereas if you're about to get pitched by a wave, you'll find um, that the orbital motion there is gonna be more oval. All right. Um, so we were talking before about wind swell and about how long these waves are and that these are not actually the waves um, that we are able to catch. So what determines how big those swells can get? So there's three factors. The three factors that decide how big the waves can get is um, one is the wind speed. So the, the speed at which the wind is blowing is very important in determining how big the waves will get. The second is wind duration. So if you had a really strong wind blowing for two minutes, you're not going to get very big swells. But if you had a really strong wind blowing for a day, you're going to get a lot bigger swells. And the third factor is called the fetch. And the fetch is the uninterrupted distance over which the wind is blowing. So here where I live on the east coast of Vancouver Island, um, the fetch is a little bit limited. You know, we have uh, like Vancouver Island has been a big, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a big obstacle <laughs> in terms of interrupting the fetch from the Pacific Ocean. So, you know, we have some winds that will blow in the Strait of Georgia that can have a fairly good sized fetch, but um, it's, it is a lot more limited than those areas that are um, like the west coast of the island that have uh, uh, this massive exposure to um, uninterrupted distance over which the wind can travel, which is the fetch. So um, there is a maximum size to which the waves can grow given a particular fetch and a particular wind speed um, and, and the, the, the time over which it takes to build up the maximum wave height for a particular fetch and a particular wind speed is three days. So if the wind blows at 20 knots it, over you know, one particular body of water, within three days, like let's say the North Pacific, within three days, um, you will have what we call fully developed seas. And at that point, the waves are not gonna get any bigger, but they're gonna be as big as they can get um, for 20 knot uh, waves in a, or sorry, <laughs> 20 knot winds in a particular uninterrupted stretch of water. So, um, yeah, so those things are, you know, if you wonder why some places make for better downwind paddling than others, um, a lot of times uh, the areas with bigger, with greater fetch, so greater uninterrupted distance over which the wind can blow, are going to have better exposure to bigger waves. So those of you in the interior um, of BC or other provinces where you're paddling on lakes, um, those long skinny lakes uh, are going to have better fetch than like a short round lake. So a short round lake will never really get uh, big, big waves building up. There just isn't the fetch to do so. But for instance, in the Okanagan, there's some really long waves, or sorry, really long um, lakes and uh, yay, the end. <laughs> and so they can get some pretty good, uh, pretty decent downwind paddling there um, because of the fetch on those long skinny lakes. 
All right. Um, so this is just a picture showing what those wind swells uh, look like in the open ocean. And you can see here this wave has gotten into shallow water because it's about to, to break. You can see this is getting close to shore here. I think there's a little tree there. But you can see those ripples across the ocean, those big um, ripples. And the coolest thing when you're flying in a plane in Hawaii or a lot of other places in the world, actually pretty much anywhere, but it's just more noticeable in Hawaii, is that when you look out the plane window, you'll always see one predominant set of corduroy. Like you'll see one really obvious set of lines like this, where it's just these stripes across the ocean. But then you can play this game where you're like, okay, well, what other swells can I see? Because at any given time, you're gonna have swells coming from more than one direction because swells are generated by storms. And there's never just one storm in one location in the Pacific at a time. There's always wind blowing in multiple places and, and every little windy patch is gonna generate um, uh, swells and they're gonna come from different directions. And so they're gonna cross each other. And so you can look down and you can see um, the, the like, let's say the biggest waves will be coming from the Northwest. But then if you look carefully, there's a whole nother set of, of waves that's crossing that at an angle coming from the Northeast and maybe another third set coming up from the South. So it's, um, it's great to have the opportunity to look at that from the sky because it's easier to see from the sky. When you're actually on the ocean, um, it's really a lot harder to see those uh, waves that are moving across from other directions that are not the big ones. Um, you've, you know, the big ones will kind of fling you around a lot. So those are hard to miss. Um, but what we want to try to, to feel when we're down there is the, the sideways, the waves that are coming from other angles and coming across the face of the big waves, because those are the ones that are going to, we're going to try to have to try to um, be uh, feeling with our butts and uh, looking out for to try to, to catch and fling us forward. All right. Um, so just one last little bit on fetch here. Uh, this is just a global map of, of the earth and uh, it's got wave heights on here. And you can see that the biggest wave heights are uh, in the Antarctic Ocean, the Southern Ocean. And um, can anybody guess why? <laughs> okay, I will, oh yeah. So there's um, uninterrupted continuous fetch, right? Cause you have um, no land obstacles in this area. There's, you know, the, the, the fetch is completely continuous here and uninterrupted. So that's why the Southern Ocean is famous for its massive waves. All right. Um, okay, so there's a couple different factors that can make waves break and spill over. Um, but, uh, you know, from a technical perspective, uh, two of the things will be if the angle of the crest um, gets smaller than 120 degrees, then it's uh, too steep and it will pitch and break. Um, or uh, if this distance gets higher than one out of seven. So if it gets, uh, if the ratio here were to go to 1.5, one and a half times um, or one and a half units high for seven units across, then again, it's too steep and it will break. Um, ooh, okay. Wave sets. This is, a, this is an important one and um, uh, an interesting one. And I, I think I have a video clip coming up for this. So you'll often hear people talking about, um, that was a big set. Um, I got cleaned up by the last set. Um, uh, you'll hear surfers talking about sets. And um, a set is just basically a group of waves. And typically when you have a set of waves, the first waves in the set and the last waves in the set will be small and the waves in the middle are gonna be the biggest. And so uh, you also hear surfers talking about the seventh wave. Um, and I think there's songs about that. <laughs> and the seventh wave is usually in the middle of the set and so everybody talks about the seventh one and then they forget about all the waves after that getting smaller again because everybody got cleaned out by the seventh wave. So, um, but yeah, typically, so the waves will start out small, then they'll get bigger and then they get smaller and then there's a bit of a lull and then the next set will start. So why is this so important to understand? Um, let us take a look at a video that some of you may have seen. I'm just got to 
switch my screen share here. Um, I know actually probably a lot of you have seen this, but this one just really never gets old. Um, okay, just a second. hear me um so i'm pausing it right here because this screenshot here or this shot here is so important where have all the waves gone right so this is the break between the sets and this is what you need to understand how to count for and look for and wait for if you're ever in a situation like this so there will almost always be breaks between sets and so if you're ever in a situation where you're trying to launch um, in Hawaii, or your crew's trying to launch for, because this is uh, the start of Nawahimi Okekai, uh, the Molokai World Champs in 2012. And uh, a lot of the crews there just um, had not ever dealt with anything like this before. And the thing is, you kind of got to just um, take your time and wait and watch and count the number of the waves and the sets um, and how long they take and uh, time it and then um, wait for the lull and then go, go, go. All right, so this one is pretty much done here. I think that's virtually the end of the clip. So um, we'll go back. All right. So that's a classic example of why it's important to um, understand sets, but now I'm gonna talk about why sets happen. Okay, so in this diagram we have uh, in A here, we have a green wave and we have a blue wave. So these waves are coming from different places. They have different wavelengths. Uh, maybe one came from Alaska and one came from Japan. Um, and let's say we're in Hawaii now, because um, that's always fun to imagine. And uh, what happens when these two waves come together at the same point is that uh, for anybody that's taken physics is um, they will uh, experience what we call interference. So there's two different kinds of interference. You either get constructive interference or destructive interference. So in order to figure out what the resulting wave or the resulting water surface is going to look like when these two waves come together, you basically add them together. So where there's two crests together, you're adding that together. So you end up with a crest that's twice as high. Where there's two troughs together, you are adding those together. And so you get a trough that's twice as deep. Whereas in the middle here, where you have um, basically uh, the, the center point of the blue wave and the center point of the green wave, so no crest, no trough together, 
it's going to be flat. And so those two waves have canceled each other out because this crest and this trough are pretty much the same size. So they've canceled each other out and you end up with basically almost flat water. So what you're seeing there is the lull between the sets. So uh, this would be the beginning of the set. And then uh, it would, uh, so it would get bigger and bigger and bigger, and then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And then this is the break between the sets. So this is why uh, we almost always have sets and why they can be fairly predictable um, because the wavelength, the wavelengths of these two sets of waves, the green one and the blue one, they're fixed. Um, so uh, that's why we can kind of count on this happening and we can count on being able to time them. Um, except um, there's always the potential for um, a third set of waves to be coming through to kind of throw everybody off and throw the odd rogue wave in there. So it's never 100% but it's uh, nevertheless a very important skill to be able to have and understand is this concept of wave sets. So again, when the waves come together um, and duplicate each other and double end up with a doubling in size, that's called constructive interference. When the waves cancel each other out, that's called destructive interference. And for those of you that have heard the term rogue wave, um, those are basically freak waves that happen when you get constructive interference uh, to the max uh, of possibly not these, just these two waves, but maybe a third set rolling two, rolling through as well, uh, could come together and you know spike that wave, uh, the resulting water surface way up. And it, it might just be something that just happens one time every like, you know, several hours or, or um, what have you based on um, just uh, uh, the freak coincidence of all three crests coming to the same place at the same time, resulting in a wave crest that's higher than the normal theoretical maximum. So uh, another picture to sort of look at uh, what the resulting surface can look like when you have two waves coming together. In this uh, image, you've got this red uh, wave here, and then you've got a black wave. And then uh, the blue filled in wave uh, is actually the, the resulting wave that, um, that the surface of the ocean experiences through constructive and destructive interference. So you can see um, it starts out, it drops down fairly steep and comes up fairly steep, but then it's the next side of it is kind of flat and gets this little mini second bump. And then it goes up steep, down steep, and then a gradual slow uphill. So this is why a lot of times when you're out on the ocean, um, it doesn't feel uh, regular and consistent. Um, and the reason why this is different in the, say the Columbia River Gorge, for instance, is you're dealing with a river where you're not getting waves coming from a lot of multiple different directions, of course, unless a um, paddle wheeler drives by, but um, you're dealing with pretty uniform, um, wind direction in the gorge. And so you don't get these kind of um, lumpy waves that have all sorts of different shapes that you just got to constantly be feeling. So it's not like you can settle in in the ocean where you can settle in in the gorge. Like you can really in the gorge, you can kind of get in a groove. Um, and in the ocean, you just kind of have to constantly be um, feeling and feeling and feeling and feeling and just, you know, feeling where, where the shapes are changing and, and eventually it sort of becomes um, autopilot. Uh, now I'm just gonna, I've got a little video clip of um, uh, Mike Giblin and Lauren uh, talking again about this kind of concept. So one second here. And then the other thing is really just sort of thinking it through, you know, uh, thinking about the way the, the waves are working. Sometimes there's a big swell going one way and a little one going the other way. And you might, uh, you know, be hunting for those big ones while riding the little ones and, uh, and sort of creating a little picture in your head of, of what's, what's there, what might happen and, and what mm -hmm. you might do. Um, the, the easy the easy answer is is you look for the holes and you try to put the nose of the boat in the hole. Um, and a, a, another thing is just to watch the waves in front of you and 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 look for those patterns. Try to anticipate where it's going and where it's going to form up and try to get there uh, at the right time. 
And again, that's just a, an experience thing. I don't, it, it's sort of hard for the beginner to, to, to understand. I think it's uh, one really good way to teach a beginner is to take them out on a two-man and just keep putting them in those situations and talking to them. Um, <clears throat> I, I remember a few years back I took Wendell, I know you interviewed Wendell, on a two-man. It's pretty funny because um, I, I was like, okay, Wendell, okay, relax, relax, relax. Okay, go, 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 go. Relax, relax, relax. Go, 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 go. And, and at one point, I turned around. I looked back, and Wendell's just exhausted. So, um, you know, uh, a, a really experienced paddler, paddler might uh, be pushing into a lot more stuff, and somebody who's a little bit more of a beginner might be just conserving energy, riding little bumps, playing with it, and uh, it really depends on how fast you want to go and how much you're willing to put into it. First of all, on on one man, Lauren. Um, I know how I catch bumps and, you know, guys like Kai and that, we, you know, we tend to sort of muscle our way through through bumps to get drops and things like that. How do you, how do you go about it? Yeah, I would think it's the same, same theory, you know, definitely uh, it's not going in a straight line, you know, you're connecting from one bump to another. A lot of times in, like, say, the Molokai solo, typical bump, you'll have three bumps running, so you're really utilizing the different bumps and you know there's a big bump that runs towards the island, a smaller bump that runs up to the island. The smaller bump is usually faster but so I think it's just really kind of like reading and connecting dots. You want to really go from one to the next. You're not ever looking behind you back here. Your vision of bumps is all from your peripheral here forward and um, really if I think if you like you're talking about pushing hard if you, if you really bust a Hump and you just get over one, it'll open up to five bumps. So right. sometimes it's really worth it to spend that extra energy. But Knowing that you're going to get. Yeah, that you're going to get that bump. Yeah, because yeah. sometimes, you know, you can kind of, you just let it go. But yeah. I think it's I think it's great, especially in training. Like I'll experiment, like I'll really just kill myself to get on a bump. Yeah. And that way, you know, for race day, like, hey, if I kill myself and push really hard, I'll get on that bump and it can open up to five or six really good ones. Right. And that's a couple hundred yards. So. Yeah. Right on. Okay. I'm back to the presentation. So yeah, it's um like they're saying it's it's really something that um comes with experience and it's a it's a very difficult thing to kind of put into words. Um but um the the the, the basic concept that both of them are uh, talking about is knowing when to push and knowing when not to push. Uh, and so, yeah, if you look at the shape of the wave, um, you can sort of get the sense for like, if you were at this point on this wave right here, if you gave a pretty good push, you might be able to get over this one and down onto this, you know, this part here. Um, whereas if you were on this part here, you know, this wave might be growing and climbing. And so you would you would not have much to gain if um, you were at this point, you would just wanna sort of sit back and, and take a break and wait for your body or for your boat to be in the position where you were almost at the crest and about to go down before you start pushing again. So if your canoe is in a bad spot and your nose is pointing upwards, um, then the, the last thing you wanna do is expend any energy at that point. And it's okay to actually just, you know, lily dip or stop paddling um, when that happens. Or basically, that's a perfect time to switch sides. Um, and uh, just, it's it's so important to uh, reserve your energy for when you get in a good position so that you can give it everything you've got. Um, that, uh, you know, it feels weird sometimes to stop paddling. Um when you're in a bad position, but it's absolutely the right thing to do so that your body can recover and be ready to absolutely hammer when you get into a, a good spot where you're about to drop your nose down into something that's um, steep or something that you can catch. Um, other concepts that have been, uh, that they mentioned a little bit uh, that have been brought up is, um, is finding angles. So in this picture, you can see this canoe and that canoe are pointing at very different angles and they're in the same body of water and they're very close together and they're probably moving at a very similar speed. Um, the main direction of the swell is, uh, appears to be going um, 
in the, uh, so neither of them appear to be going directly in the direction of the swell, which kind of seems to be across this way. You've got this canoe in front going sideways to the swell this way and the other canoe going sideways to the swell the opposite direction. Um, because uh, as we talked about, those big swells are moving way too fast uh, for us to catch. And so if we try to like Lauren was talking about catch this smaller bump that's moving across the waves, um, that one is something that is a little bit um, easier to catch. And then if you get your momentum up on one of those little waves that's moving across the bigger wave, then sometimes if you're lucky, you can, it can fling you or slingshot you down the face of one of these bigger waves if that bigger wave is steep enough. If that bigger wave is not steep, then good luck. <laughs> Don't burn yourself out. Um, another concept that we've heard everybody mention is um, trying to get your nose pointed uh, downhill. So that is the ultimate goal. Um, so spend as much time as possible with your nose pointing downhill. And as soon as you start to fall off that wave, uh, you, that's when you let go. That's when you absolutely do not waste en any energy at all. Don't fight it. Just accept it. Just give in. Um, it's not going to help to pound it out when you're pointing uphill. Don't fight gravity. Um, and then using uh, smaller surface waves as a slingshot onto bigger waves and wind swells. So that's what you can see um, these guys have done here. They're coming across on these little white cappy waves, which are um, just smaller wind chop type waves, which are the wind chop type waves are our friend um, in the open ocean because they're steep, they're small, they're short, and they're not moving as fast. Um, so we actually can get on those ones and those ones uh, will give us a lot of ground. Um, and don't fight the battles you can't win. So here in this picture here, um, these guys are just falling off this wave. So they were riding this wave and then you can see this wave now is rolling underneath them and they're about to slip down the back side of it. So at this point, this is a perfect time to call a change hut ho. Um, if you're on your one man, just um, switch over, stop paddling, take a little break and then get ready. And then once, just before, um, you know, just before you get to the bottom of the back of that trough, that's when you're going to want to start to dig in again is just before you get to the bottom. Um, and just before you want to start paddling before your nose gets pointing downhill uh, because you need to get your momentum up again. So anyway, when you're pointing uphill, use this time to relax, recover, change sides, and get ready to go. Um, okay, I have just a couple more short two-minute videos here to share. Um, let's see, where are those ones? Just one second. Uh, Bear with me a moment. Okay. Getting closer. All right. Oh, wrong one. <laughs> Oh my gosh, there's so many videos here. Okay, <laughs> one second. I'll speak this for everyone happened. when it, when I say it's like the fact that you have so many videos of this stuff and the fact that you're showing videos is so helpful. So we'll be patient, Zoe, if you need a second to <laughs> video because these are priceless. Thank you so much. Oh, awesome, awesome, glad to hear it. Okay, here we go. This is um, Pete Primo. This is the dream, by the way. Look at none of those guys are even paddling. Okay, so here, these guys have enough speed going that they are like, okay, if we give her right now, we can pop over that next wave and even get. In So there they popped over that one and they just got in front of it which is awesome and now they're gonna have to angle off to catch
Okay, so again, notice here the primary wave direction is this way. Um, those guys are heading off to the left. But if you watch carefully right to the end of this video clip, you'll you'll actually be able to see that cross wave coming. Just watch carefully, watch the surface. So you get you can kind of see it coming across right here. So that's the one that they that they're riding. Um, anyway, freaking phenomenal, right? Okay, so good. Uh, and then I think there's one more here. Oh yeah. Okay, so again, note the wave is coming towards us and they're moving across it because this wave that's coming toward us is too big, moving too fast. That's not the wave you're trying to catch. And look at how sharp that angle is. I mean, they're not even anywhere close to heading straight down the face of this wave because even if they did, even if it was steep enough for them to manage to come straight in, what would happen is the nose of that canoe would then jam into the backside of this wave in front, which would then stall them out and stop their forward motion. So in one manning, this is really important too, because something that often happens is we get tempted into wanting to ride the steepest part of the wave and go straight down because it looks really fast and it is fast. It would be the fastest you would go, but then if you're not careful and you don't angle off, then you will end up jamming the nose of your boat into the back of the wave in front of you. And that will be really hard to recover from. So it's much more important to not get tempted into that really, really steep face and just zooming straight down the front of it. Um, and try to um, angle yourself off to the side a little bit because that way you'll be able to hang on to your motion, um, your momentum. You'll be able to pop through. Um, there, there'll be these little gaps that will open up that you'll be able to slide through and jump onto the next wave in front. And you won't get that if you've got the nose of your boat jammed up onto the front of the wave, in, at the back of the wave in front of you. Awesome. Okay, back. So many things to share here. I keep getting lost from where I am. Okay, wait, gotta move this. All right. Um, okay, so yeah, so those are just, um, yeah, so we just finished going over some of the general rules of, of what, uh, what you wanna try to think about when you're looking for where to put your boat. Um, I have this in here just as a quick um, sidebar. Uh, sometimes people ask about why certain waves plunge and some waves spill. Plunging waves actually make a tube um, and it's like an air-filled tube um, between the crest and the foot of the wave. 
And these types of waves form when a deep water wave suddenly encounters a shallow reef. And that change in sudden change in water depth makes the wave get, it jacks it up really quickly. Um, and so that's why it pitches over so violently. And that's, you know, what you get at Jaws um, that water goes from super deep to really shallow and a very, um, it just comes up on a reef. Um, and so once the water hits that, it just jacks up straight vertical, but there's other beaches, uh, where you'll get a shallow sandy beach and, and the beach just is, goes shallow, goes out for, for a long, long distance. Um, gradually getting deeper and deeper. Um, and so on those beaches, that gradual change allows the wave also to gradually change. And so that's when you get, um, you tend to get spilling waves. Um, so they occur on gradually sloping ocean bottoms. Um, and the crest of the wave, the spilling wave just kind of slides down the face of the wave as it's breaking. Um, yeah. One question here that kind of came up is that, is this kind of where we see that circular motion come into that compressed stuff? Um, is a question from Dawn in the chat. Yes, exactly, Dawn. That's exactly what's happening here. Yeah. So the orbitals are, in this case, are definitely squashed into the oval shape. So yeah, that is what we're seeing. And then if that gets um, any steeper, if it gets too steep, like in the in the previous wave, um, the orbitals basically go out the window because the wave has pitched over the top. Um, and it's in in what the wave would consider to be very shallow water. Um, the last sort of new concept I'm going to introduce here really quickly is just the concept of refraction. Um, so this um, is a point of land on Oahu. And it's, um, you know, if you think about it, no matter which beach you've ever gone to, the waves are always breaking directly towards you as you're standing on shore. So if, if waves are moving from, you know, east to west, and you're on a shoreline that's facing south, then why is it that the waves are still breaking towards you? And that's because um, if the waves were traveling, if this is the shore that you're standing on and this set of waves is traveling from, okay, in this case, west to east, um, the part of the wave that's in deep water is still moving like normal, but the part of the wave that's in shallow water um, gets slowed down as it bunches up. Um, so, um, it will then, uh, what that causes it to, the causes the, the part that gets in shallow water um, to, to bend. And so when you're standing here on shore, it'll look like the wave is breaking straight into shore and it's really sort of not, it's really sort of peeling from left to right, but it has the appearance of breaking straight on shore because the shallow water, the shallow end of the wave um, has changed. Uh, shape and, and speed, but the, the deep end is still um, acting like a deep water wave. So that's why in this picture here, no matter if you're on this shoreline that's facing this direction or this shoreline that's facing this direction, um, the waves as they approach shore are always going to bend and um, refract and um, move directly towards the shore because of the fact that um, that one end of the wave is in shallow water. Um, oh, was I just doing that on the wrong slide? Oh no, I was. I was talking about two slides while only one was up. Oh my gosh. Okay, so this was the one I was kind of talking about. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> um, yeah, I was looking at the next slide. So yeah, here's this point on Oahu where, um, yeah, this, uh, this it, it's interesting because if you're on this shore, which is facing north, or this shore, which is facing east, um, Either way, it looks like the wave is breaking directly on shore. Um, but what's happened is just basically this one um, uh, set of waves, which is moving in this direction here, when the one end of it reaches shallow water, it bends that end, just the end of that wave. And so the waves will always look like they're breaking directly towards shore. Okay, so this is, I'm just gonna wrap it up now. Um, general downwind guidelines that we've uh, discussed today. Um, look for troughs in front of you and try to angle toward them. So if you have troughs that are slightly to the right or slightly to the left when you're um, angling down a wave, uh, those are always the ones you want to try to uh, work towards. Try to avoid pointing straight down into a trough. You might jam into the back of the wave in front of you and stall. 
Now, the interesting thing here is that in order to avoid this, uh, you will often need to slow yourself down. So there's different techniques for slowing yourself down, um, uh, including angling off, leaning your body back, uh, the hand drag, um, or the paddle drag even. So there's different ways you can kind of slow yourself down uh, because at all costs, you want to avoid zooming straight down the back of that wave and jamming into jamming the nose of your boat into the back of the wave in front of you because then you will be stalled. Your foot well will fill up with water and you will have to work really hard to get your momentum back up again. Avoid paddling uphill. If you find yourself paddling uphill, back off your power. In one man, you can even just stop paddling altogether um, and just switch the angle of the nose of your boat. Uh, just, just even if you can't see or feel anything, just go 45 degrees or something like that to whatever direction you're pointing in. And you're much likely, much more likely to be able to get out of that rut um, than if you stay pointing um, in that one direction. Uh, what you aim the nose of the boat for depends on your power output. So yeah, if um, you practice will help you learn what you can power yourself onto and what you can't. So there's going to be certain waves that are going to be, you're, you'll recognize the wave as, oh, that the shape, based on the shape of this wave, I believe uh, based on what I understand of my own power ability that I can power over the top of the one in front of me and down into the next trough. So I'm just going to give her. Um, but if the wave in front of you, you know, you can't get over it and you're just going to kind of want to stay where you're at, then you just angle off to the side um, and just kind of stick your nose um, at, a, at an angle to the, to the trough in front of you and something else will almost always open itself up. Use the small runners to drop into bigger bumps. So those are the small runners, means the ones that are the little uh, wind chop, winds uh, waves that are running across the tops of um, the big swells. And if they're lucky, if you're lucky, you can get those little ones to kind of slingshot you into the bigger bumps. Doesn't always happen. And if it does, it often doesn't last long, but it can be a great way to get ahead, um, get a little bit of an extra boost. Um, definitely, definitely so, so, so important. Um, save your energy for what you can catch and then go for it and commit to getting that bump. Um, so it can be hard again when you've been training flat water um, most of your life uh, to uh, get used to stopping or slowing down or even trying to physically slow down your hull speed. But um, sometimes these things are exactly what you need to, to wrap your head around um, so that you can be fully energized and ready to go um, when uh, you're in the right place to do so. Hey, Zoe, um, can I ask you a quick question? Sure. Hi, Kim Reeves from Bellingham. When you were talking about, you know, when you're in the trough, right? So not paddling uphill and you're talking about angling, you know, I, I almost surf with the, just totally just a weedless, almost never use a surfing rudder unless I'm at, down at the gorge. If I angle just a little bit, is that gonna help prevent broaching? Cause I know sometimes when you're like trying to lift up on that wave that's coming up behind you, you can get broachy. So I'm wondering if, if I have like just a slight bit of angle, do you, I, I don't know, does that decrease the opportunity for brooch or is it just six of one, half a dozen of the other, whether or not you get Loki on the brooch? <laughs> it kind of depends a lot on the shape of the wave really, because um, if the wave that's coming behind you is uh, crumbling at you, then it's, it's gonna be broachy um, and you're gonna wanna try to angle away from that broaching crest. Um, so when you say so, crumbling at me, <laughs> I'm talking like, about the one that's behind you. Like, yeah, no, I get that. But when you say crumbling at me, like, so in the, our bay, our angle is a little steep and our wavelengths short oftentimes. So when you say crumbling at me, can you, can you tell me what you mean by that expression? That does it mean it's like it's starting to roll over a little? It's like breaking over a little bit? Yeah, so I'm talking about like white water um, forming at the top of the wave, the kind of right, white okay. water. Yeah, gotcha. So the kind okay. of white water where if it hits you, it's going to sort of just like Lift. stick your, yeah, it's going to stick your ama in and it's just going to make you slow down and, and get sort of stuck. Gotcha. Um, okay. 
Yeah. So, I mean, but definitely like angling allows you to sort of escape that if you can, like if the wave that's behind you, if you can tell where the, where the peak of it is, like if the peak is on your right, maybe go to the left. If the peak is on your left, then maybe zoom to the right and just try to stay away from where that, that white water part is going to like suck you, suck you down. Right. Um, that's always but, like, that's always yeah. the hot mess, right? When you get lifted, yeah. it's like, no, <laughs> right. But it's hard to generalize though, because every wave shape is gonna, um, require a different response so, so you have to be a smart paddler that's what you're saying not well you have to be an experienced paddler <laughs> yeah no i you know i, I it's, when you have a weedless too it's like you just have less rudder in the water so totally yeah yeah, yeah. 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 it's yeah. um yeah it's good to have a quiver of uh rudders so you can swap them out because i get it like the weedless rudders are so great they're so great yeah. um because nothing messes with your mind, like thinking you might have caught some weeds in that last chunk that you just paddled past. And then, you know, you can't stop thinking about it and get all distracted. And so, um, yeah, the weedless rudders are so awesome. Um, but I think that what I've heard is that right now Ozone is working on um, weedless surfing rudder designs. And so oh. hopefully, yeah, so hopefully that's coming down the pipeline and we'll have those to look forward to really soon. Yeah, that'd be great. We get a lot of weeds in the bay here. Yeah, 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 for right. sure. Hey, so those are that. under, those are under, well, I think it was, yeah, I can't remember who exactly it was from Ozone, but somebody was just telling me about that a couple of days ago. So oh, I think yeah. it's, I think it's in the works. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Joey. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Um, oh yeah, okay, so downwind paddling is like a series of very short, very hard sprints. Uh, anywhere between five to 15 plus or minus um, with short recovery periods in between when riding away. So it's definitely, you don't want to think about um, uh, downwind paddling as being a long steady. Uh, it's not, there's nothing steady about it at all. Um, it's um, on off, up, down, um, power back off. It's very, very, very dynamic. Um, and if you do try to paddle steadily, um, you're going to really tire yourself out. Um, I have a, a little one here who's <laughs> barking at something. Um, okay, and if you do stall out, angle off the swell and look for small runners to build up speed. So yeah, definitely if you do get stuck or you fall off the back of a wave or you jam into the wave in front of you, don't just sit there. Um, definitely try to change the angle of your boat. Um, that's gonna be one of the things that's gonna help you get out of there quicker. Um, Okay. What, oh, what's the next one? Uh, try to anticipate what's coming up behind you based on what's happening in front of you. Um, yeah. So uh, the wave, if the wave is really steep in front of you, um, then that's a lot of the times you want to be heading towards that, that, that steep back in front of you, unless of course, but like at an angle, <laughs> you don't want to go straight into it. But generally where the wave in front of you, if it's to the left or to the right is steepest, that's where it's going to be the fastest. Um, swells occur in sets. Uh, look for a secondary wave direction. That's really important um, because the primary wave direction is almost always the one we're not going to be able to catch. Um, and that's another hard thing to get your head around. You're out there in the ocean. There's this big rolling waves moving under you. And you're like, how come I'm not catching these waves? Well, you, you can't. So don't even try. And try to just stop looking for them. Um, you want to try to be looking for the little ones. And like Leanne said, feeling with your butt, like you gotta, you gotta be looking and feeling for, um, those smaller waves. And, and, oh, and another pointer is if you can't see them, then just angle your boat and see what happens because it will find you if it's there, if your boat is in the right direction, it will find you. And I remember, um, when, uh, Rick and I first moved to Maui and we'd go out on the OC2 and of course he was like, just absolutely phenomenal. I know Leanne got to paddle OC2 with him. He was super impressed with Leanne and the OC2, by the way. But anyway, um, when, <laughs> when, um, you know, I'd be, I'd be in the front of the OC2 with him and he'd be steering all over the place. And I'd be like, what, what is he even seeing? And then all of a sudden the boat would take off and I'd be like, whoa, how did you even know? And then but the thing is, if you just keep trying that, if you just keep doing that, then eventually you will see and feel too. But you just have to have faith that it's there, even if you can't see it and just try, just put that angle on the nose and just give it a shot and see what it feels like. Uh, choose the path of least resistance. Don't go uphill. Don't jam your nose in. 
ultimate goal, maximize the use of the ocean's energy to move you forward while conserving your own energy. Um, and then I think uh, this was my bonus point number here that I just added. Um, sometimes slowing yourself down is necessary to avoid jamming yourself into a standstill. I mentioned this earlier, slowing yourself down. A lot of paddlers you're gonna see one man's um, are just gonna lean way back um, because they don't wanna take off too early and like zoom down the face of that wave and get stuck. They just wanna hold off just long enough that they can catch it at the sweet spot um, so that they can use its momentum for a longer period of time in a longer direction. So that leaning back thing stops you from zooming, zooming forward. On a one man, your body posture is everything. So if you pitch forward, it's gonna help you dive down onto that next wave. If that's what you need, then that's what you do. But if you're going too fast, you can lean back and slow yourself down. Um, uh, right, common techniques for slowing down, leaning back, um, angling off can also slow you down. Um, the hand drag, sometimes you see, you know, people are just having so much fun out there and they're so chill and so comfortable and so happy. And it's just, they just kind of like drag their fingers in the water um, to slow down if they're going too fast. And that's just like ultimate comfort zone. Um, you don't need to try that, <laughs> um, but you might get there someday. Um, the paddle drag, sometimes that one can be actually kind of convenient. Um, your paddle's already in the water. If you feel like you're going too fast, just kind of brace a little bit with your paddle that can slow you down. Um, and the foot drag, I don't recommend that one at all, unless you're on a breaking shore break wave and you're about to get pitched down the face of something you don't want to go down, stick both your feet in the water. That's a big foot drag that will slow you down and save you from getting chucked down the face of a breaking shore break wave. Um, and... So that is it. I have a couple of um, OC1 downwind footage shots I can share, but I see that we only have 15 minutes left. And so I wanna let Leanne talk and other people talk and you guys ask questions and stuff. So if there was time at the end, I could show some OC1 footage, but um, for now, I feel like somebody else should talk. I've been talking a lot here, so yeah. That's all right. Thank you so much, Zoe. We've got a bunch of questions rolling in, both private messages to me, text messages to me, <laughs> Instagram messages to me. Um, but one of the common ones that I'm asking is or hearing is about what's the difference between lake and ocean? Or is there a little bit more, like you talked about ocean where we've got multiple waves coming from multiple directions and then we get the, the convergence and the divergence kind of thing. Um, but is there a big difference kind of that we can narrow down to a couple points between riding lake versus riding ocean? You know, Leanne, um, yeah, I mean, I, I I would basically say like what, what you sort of implied initially about um, the ocean is going to have waves coming from way more directions and be way more confused and lumpy and the lakes are going to be more organized because they'll generally have uh, wind coming from one predominant direction, except for really big lakes like the Ontario lakes. Those are going to act like the ocean sometimes, but I'm going to defer to you also to answer this because you have way more experience lake paddling than I do. So over to you. Um, yeah, like you said, it's a lot, there's a lot more regular waves. And I always said that like, that's one of my benefits when I get to the gorge because I'm used to lake waves where they're predominantly coming for one direction, which is similar to the gorge in terms of that wind tunnel. Whereas getting out in the ocean, you, you, you have to get used to predicting where the waves are coming from. And that also ties into the, riding the runners that you can't see but by no being aware of what direction different swells are coming from when you talked about when in doubt just turn your boat if you're falling off anyway but if you know which direction runners are coming from then you have okay if it's if the runners are coming from you know your left side then yeah I'm going to angle towards the right because there's a chance I might pick up a runner that I didn't even know was was there kind of thing but if they're not coming from that side why would I turn my boat that way Right. type of thing um but lake waves is definitely picking your battles um in terms of them there's some and dawn makes a comment of this in the chat she says there's some times where it's too steep to get on but there's kind of like this magical steepness or wave height that's easier to get on when they're too big it's too hard it's too fast because those waves are moving too quick but when they're a little smaller it's easier to get on and dawn you're absolutely right when they are too steep and too or too moving too fast they are hard to get on because you have to bring your boat speed up to be able to get on those and so if you don't have the power or you're still working on technique to get there yeah it's a heck of a lot harder where you might have um other paddlers that can get them and other paddlers can't but her question i want to put to you zoe is that in lake ontario 
it's a big lake and they have shorter periods, i.e. a three to four second, and are dealing with wind, so winds, no swell. Um, so does the period, you're the more sciencey person, <laughs> um, does the period matter in terms of having to link, trying to link waves? Or is it the same kind of deal of where when you get on one, you're looking for the hole and you're looking for kind of where they're starting to, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? That little break in the wave, that little low part so that you can yeah. jump through and get on the next one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so don't get hung up in the technical stuff like period. Just, I, you know, I, I shared all that so you could better understand waves. But um, yeah, don't even think about that super technical stuff when you're out there. Um, so yeah, what Leanne's talking about, um, at one point when I was doing three Maliko runs a day when I lived on Maui, um, uh, one of the little epiphanies that I had was, you know, when you're looking at that zone in front of you, like Lauren was talking about this in your peripheral vision, um, uh, I would see, you know, maybe on the left side of that zone, there would be a high area. And I, I learned quickly that if that area was high now, then it was about to go low. And so um, if I saw a high area on my left, I would kind of aim towards that because by the time I got there, it would be low and I would be lifted up perfectly. So um, those open up those little pockets that Leanne was talking about. So um, yeah, there's there's going to be areas. So in front of you, and again, I don't really know how this works in, in lakes, but um, uh, and I, I'm guessing on big lakes, it's probably much the same where it's not like in the gorge where it's a straight line across in front of you. It's like in front of you, there is a wave, but it's kind of got a high point and lower points. And um, you're going to want to figure out how to sneak through those lower points because that's what allows you to get yourself onto the next wave in front and work your way forward through the waves. So um, yeah, so I'm guessing, I don't know, Leanne, that if that's a thing or at dawn, you can tell me too, if that's a thing. That sounds, that it does sound about right. I just wanted to get a confirmation on that. It does yeah. it get similar sort of like smallish ocean-like uh, conditions. It's not like the gorge at all, where it's more of a, I guess, a conveyor belt, you know? Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I just kind of wanted to get a confirmation in, in your opinions. And yeah, right on, Dawn. <laughs> So this ties into kind of like you talked about in the lake waves, it's like you can be on a lake and you're looking beside you and the same with the ocean is like, okay, I have absolutely nothing here, but it looks great over there. And so it's just having that confidence that, you know what, the waves are going to come, be patient, don't kill yourself for it. But often, um, and this has to do with kind of those shoulders that you were just talking about. And this is one of the things that the last couple of years have been a big um, epiphany for me is like, if you're in the high part of that wave, so if I'm thinking about it lengthways, Dawn, you talked about the conveyor belt of the gorge. And it's like, okay, if I go straight down, I'm going to pearl unless I can hold myself up high. Whereas in the ocean and in the lakes where we've got those shoulders, it's like, if I aim straight down into the deep pocket, I'm likely going to go, I call it going over the falls because you zoom down and then your nose is just totally buried. You're getting like a couple of weeks ago, it's the water here is less than six degrees Celsius right now. And it's bloody freaking cold. So it's like, I don't want to go over falls. So angling off, um, angling off that wave, looking at the shoulder and then going, okay, I still have enough speed from the shoulder that I can go over another shoulder in front of me, angle into that pocket, get some more speed, come off another shoulder. And so that's kind of, I'm looking at not going for the big rides, but taking the, the smaller ones that I can control better off the shoulders instead of continuing going over the falls, <laughs> stalling out, going, working hard, going over the falls again, stalling well, I'm glad, out. I'm glad you brought that it's up. Just way too much I think work. A, lot of, a lot of people when, they, when they're starting out, especially in the lake, that's all they think about. Because when you first learn, it's you're trying to catch one wave. And so a lot of people will are all about catching that one wave, shooting down, what's my max speed, all that kind of stuff. And then they wait for something to come from behind instead of linking left and right and looking for these little, like, I kind of liken it to, um, they say moguls, but it's it's really more like slalom skiing. You know, you're kind of fi finding this path. You're not going in a straight line, uh, mm -hmm. like a cross country ski race. It's more like, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're snaking through 
And as opposed to just waiting for stuff to come from behind and, you know, shooting down as fast as you can. So I'm yeah. really glad yeah, that up. That's a really good point, Don. And I think that that's half the battle is just coming to terms with that and accepting that and, and like, and, and actually paddling that way. Cause it's, it's hard, it's hard to let go of, you know, the, the, the ways that we've, you know, traditionally paddled in flat water and, and uh, have developed this completely different mindset. So that's a really good point. Yeah. And, and like Zoe mentioned, it's like you're looking for the troughs, not because of what's there right now, but what's going to be there when you get there, right? Yeah. So that's another kind of mental uh, mindset you, <laughs> you need to think about because you're not, you can't see what you're going to be riding because it, it's not there yet. Like it's not there when you're looking. It's going to be there when you get there, right? That's Is that right? That's the thing. That motion. That's yeah. the toughest thing, Ryan. I, I, I'm still trying to figure it all out, but that that's the toughest thing for sure. So one of the questions that came up from the chat from Omar is that sometimes when those waves get a little steep and we lose that contact with the rudder, how do we, how do we deal those with those situations? Like I've got my, I've got my option, but I paddle V1. So I know how to steer a boat with a paddle, but are there options for people that may not know how to paddle steer? What do you do when you lose contact with your rudder? Well, ultimately you want to get good enough at surfing that that doesn't happen um, <laughs> or get a longer rudder. No, I'm just kidding. So yeah, uh, like, like the, the guys who are, and girls who are um, the, the most amazing downward paddlers, that doesn't happen to them. They, their rudders don't pop out. Um, and so that's, that's the goal. Um, and so, you know, when your rudder's out, um, you're a little bit, yeah, if you don't have the V1 skills, which I don't, um, then you're, you're just kind of hooped and you just kind of got to, you just, you just got to work through it until your rudder catches again. Um, with the goal in mind of learning your angles good enough that that doesn't happen. And I'm, you know, I paddled in Hawaii for 13 years and, you know, did a million downwind runs and um, I haven't mastered that yet, but it's, uh, I, you know, you definitely get way better at it just from spending more time out there. But um, that's another angle thing. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely angle and boat placement. And if, you, um, if you're doing it right, then that, that isn't gonna happen. And so I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm not answering your question very well, how to rescue yourself when that does happen, because I'm not very good at it either. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know, Leanne, do you want to add anything in since you're the one with the mad B1 skills? It's it's like, it only comes into play when they start to get really big and really steep. And there's a great video um, from earlier this winter of Kai Chung having to rescue himself um, with a V1 stroke as he's coming around Diamond Head and he's got that really steep one around him and it just kind of caught him off guard and there's no way to do it. So he had to stick in that, that V1 thing. But as Kimberly Reeves added to this in the chat is like, starting to angle yourself. And it really is all about your angles. So if we think about what Johnny Puakia says often, he's like, ride with your feet, surf with your feet um, to change those angles, right? It's not about working hard. It's not about um, paddling really hard. It's about using the angles of the waves with your rudder to be able to, to navigate. So that, again, so those things don't pop out behind you. Um, the rudder doesn't pop out. Um, there's an interesting question here from, from Derek Schroeder in Ontario. Um, in one of your slides, your downwind point, you had point two, which I can't remember what it was. I think it was two slides back. He wanted to know if, would flying the AMA, thus changing the nose lift help in whatever that point two was. Okay, hang on. Let me see if I can go there. This one, try to avoid pointing straight down into a trough. Yeah. That one. Yeah. Yeah. Does, uh, what does, so what does flying the AMA do? He's talking about helping with changing oh. the nose lift, but. So flying the AMA, yeah. Um, I mean, it also reduces your drag and, and helps you go faster. And also like, if you think about it, if you're trying to, to angle um, and you've got two hulls in the water, the AMA and the hull, then that can make it harder to, to turn, to steer. And so if you lift the AMA, then you've only got that one point of contact with the water. It's easier to to, you're, you're more maneuverable. So it helps with your maneuverability and your angling and reducing drag. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I, Leanne, do you have anything to add? No, totally same, same idea. And sometimes we can use that, that AMA lift to get that little bit more speed to, instead of taking a paddle stroke to make that jump. But if you're, 
it looks cool to be on a wave and surf your armor, but often it's going to give you more speed when we actually want less so that we can sit up higher on the wave. And that's the trick is sitting up higher so that you have a better field of vision. So you can see with your periphery of what's going to form in front. Once you see that, okay, I can time this, then go down the wave, use that speed and get in to what's coming. And I am so upset right now that it is already 527 because it feels like this conversation can go on for hours. But yeah, we, we, we have to turn it back over to Ron because he has some things he has to say. Awesome. But thank you so oh. much, Zoe, for coming um, okay. on with us today. You can talk for a couple of minutes more. I don't really have much to say. <laughs> uh, well, but, um, I was just going to say that, you know, if anybody has any more questions about this stuff, feel free to reach out to me. Um, my email, Zoe at HanahoePaddlesports.com. Also, for those of you who have canoes coming in our um, our April container. Uh, as of like an hour ago, the container is now parked in Vancouver Harbor. Um, but unfortunately, it's not going to unload until April 21st. Um, but if anybody's paddling in Vancouver Harbor and wants to go like drool over the container with the canoes in it, the, the name of the ship is the Sea Span Yangtze. And it's just sitting there off of uh, Kitts Beach. Um, <laughs> um, you can go like maybe try to climb on the ship and open the container doors and chuck some canoes overboard. Um, also, uh, just one more little um, piece of info for anybody in Western Canada who um, uh, would like another an, an outward canoe. Our container, our April container is sold out, but we have another container coming this summer and uh, it's only 25% full at this point. So we have um, lots more room available for OC1s. And my last little plug is that we do demos anytime to suit your needs. Um, if anybody ever wants to arrange an OC1 demo, come and try our whole fleet of um, Kaiva boats and Puakea boats and Outer Zone boats, uh, my Giblin design boats. We've got them all and you can just come and just you know connect with us anytime and we're happy to hook you up with the demo. And we also have paddles you can demo, um, Palfa Mala and Puakea blades. Um, so yeah, just reach out to us anytime about surfing questions or boats or whatever, um, we're happy to help. And if you're in the interior, I have boats that we can demo um, that are ozone boats as well. We've got the Gemini, we'll have the Kai Kai, we'll have the Valeri Pro um, here available for demo for Hannah Howe, as well as the, uh, the Puakia paddles. So Sweet. demos, Thanks, yeah. lessons, anything like that. Um, so it can help hook you up with that kind of stuff. And if you have questions, please, like this is a great conversation we can do on the core website under chat as well, in terms of talking about downwind questions, things like that as well. So everybody can benefit but feel free to, uh, to contact any of us here on Cora or Zoe or Hannah Howe or myself with, with questions. We love yeah, talking thanks. about paddling if you hadn't noticed. Thanks so yeah, much for having me today, you guys. Thanks That's very so much. Fun. Yeah, that was great. Fantastic presentation. Uh, so as Man Leanne mentioned, um, if you go on Cora website under interact, uh, we've got uh, the video conference series posts set up there and you can type in messages on that post specifically with respect to this uh, this session I think so that'll um, concentrate some of the questions in one place okay uh, so thanks again Zoe that's fantastic uh, Thank really, you. Infor really informative in terms of like the interference and you know understanding what what you know why some waves are bigger than others and the troughs and all that sort of stuff um, so Next up uh, on the video conference, there's about a town hall on uh, April the 24th. It's OC1 Maintenance and Repair. We've got Dan Hund, who used to be from uh, down Washington State, and he's now up uh, in Vancouver uh, with Jericho Paddling Club. And we'll also have a uh, repair guy from Fairway Gorge as well. And also, um, at the last CORA board meeting uh, last Wednesday, we approved a spring virtual small boats race series. Uh, at, uh, after the completion of the winter series. Uh, so the first one up will be the third week of April and the host clubs will be Comox Valley and uh, Vancouver Ocean Sports. So, and there'll be another race in May and another race in June. So keep your eyes peeled for those ones as well. We hope to get a lot of people out for that one, uh, those series as well. Okay. And uh, that's it, I think. Thanks, uh, thanks, Ron. Thanks, everyone. Uh, for those of you who want to review uh, Zoe's presentation, it'll be on uh, Cora's website uh, tomorrow afternoon. So you can go and click and watch it and fast forward and rewind and look at some of her slides and videos and so on. So that'll be uploaded uh, tomorrow afternoon. And uh, 
We'll be in touch with you, as Ron said, with the next town halls and coach clinics. Uh, so I'm going to turn the off button on pretty soon. So let's give uh, everybody a wave goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Zoe. Thanks a lot, Zoe. Thank you. Bye.